Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to um, the presentation today. Um, so my name is Maru. Um, I run um, a game development company here in Auckland called Metia Interactive. And I'm going to talk to you today about one of the game projects that we've been working on um, for quite some time. In fact, about 14 years. Um, the idea came about about 16 years ago uh, when I was um, playing with my cousin um, on PlayStation 1, I think, um, and we were playing Tomb Raider, and she said to me, oh, well, imagine if that was um, a Māori character and um, a Māori female character, and I was like, yeah, how cool would that be? So it was just like, it wasn't even an idea, it was just a random sort of comment. And, um, but it kind of stuck with me, you know, and I wasn't in game development at this time, it was just, um, I was doing my game thing, playing um, computer games and, and stuff, but that idea stuck with me, and um, 14 years ago when I um, established Meteor Interactive, it was to be one of the first games that um, I had on my list to develop. So anyway, this character here, her name is um, Maya, um, she's the hero of the story. And so the journey of the story is based all around her, her experiences and attractions. So keeping in mind that I, started, I had this idea about 14 years ago, um, you're probably wondering what happened in these 14 years. And this is what I'm going to talk about now. So I had great expectations. Um, I thought I'd had the best idea ever for uh, a third person that action adventure game for the, at that time, I think it was PlayStation 2, and that um, I was going to take it to interested parties in New Zealand and overseas and get some funding and make this game. Uh, that's how, you know, that was my thought. I was like, I've got a great idea, I'm going to go and get some money now. So what I did was um, I packaged up the idea as best I could, um, put a pamphlet together with some images, um, with the basic storyline without giving too much away. Um, tried to get some funding here first in New Zealand. Um, and that didn't work out very well. I went to places like Creative New Zealand and they said to me, well, this is technical, you need to go and speak to someone at TechNZ. So I went to Tech and they said, oh, this is creative. You need to go and speak to, you know, um, creative NZ. So at that time, the idea, the project, everything about it just fell into a big crack because there was no in-between. It was either your IT or your creative, and that's it, sorry. So government funding um, was out of the question. So I thought I'd try for some uh, publisher funding. Um, after that, I went overseas, took my project with me, this little A4 pamphlet with some pretty pictures inside. Um, made a lot of connections, talked to a lot of people. Um, these American publishers were really interested um, in the idea. They were interested in me and who I was actually, because they were like, where's your accent from? You know, where are you from? And I'm from New Zealand, and they're like, how can you speak English? And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean how can I speak English. And they're like, aren't you? I'm like, a native person? And I'm like, yeah. So it, it was a really good um, conversation starter, you know, which led, um, led on perfectly into talking about Guardian. So there was lots and lots of interest there about the idea of the Māori culture, the female character and how unusual it was. Why would I choose to put a female character in? as a hero and all that, but the reality was <coughs> I had a lot of this. Maybe. Um, looks good, we love the idea, we love the concept, um, we love the whale writer, um, <coughs> movie, the film, and oh, we love the other one, you know, with the gang members and the team. I was like, oh yeah, that one too. <laughs> so they kind of knew um, about New Zealand, about Māori culture, um, but 
I guess when I reflect back now as to why I had a lot of maybes and no's was, and I taking their feedback was, there wasn't enough content there. Um, they wanted to see it in action, so they wanted to see a prototype of some sort. Um, it was too much investment, you know, in the millions. Um, I had no reputation because I hadn't made a computer game before, any sort of game before. I had just literally set up my company um, and tried to sell an idea, which was really hard. But I think because at that time I was quite new to the industry and maybe a little naive, I just thought, yeah, I can just go out there and do it. But I learned quite quickly. And I say quickly, this would have been after a year or maybe two, that that's not how it worked. So I had a lot of nuns, basically, as well. So there was a pivot point, the first pivot point, I'll say. Um, where I decided that I'll try and branch out into something more than just games. So I thought, well, let's have a look at comic books. Let's do something a bit more cost effective and a bit more easier. Um, looked at comic books, uh, looked at it being a film. In fact, I did partner up with a film company. Um, it was a five year joint venture, and they were going to package it up. And, we had a film script written for it, and they were going to take it overseas and get the film going while I was still working away on getting the game off the ground. Um, it didn't work out either. Um, lots and lots of reasons why. But um, I decided, well, I'll just carry on doing what I'm doing and work on the story some more, um, try and build some more content. We did actually put a game demo together and we had Maya running around in the forest and it was quite cool. But that's all it was, it was just Maya running around in the forest. And so there's no combat or anything. It just showed that you know, we have demo. Um, there was one other important reason why this game wasn't getting funded as a game, and that was because I still didn't have um, developer experience as well. So a bigger pivot came along. And that was for me to sort of step back and think about um, what I could do, what was achievable, you know, in terms of um, making a game. And so I had this idea, which was kind of funny because a couple of years beforehand, I had entered into an Auckland City Council competition and I had put Guardian in as the project. And so it was an ideas competition. I thought, perfect, this is an idea. Um, so I went into this competition, I became, oh, I was one of 17 finalists, um, I didn't win, but I got access to some mentoring and all that, um, but we had to write a business plan for the project, so I was having a mind block, as you do when you're writing business plans, and I started doodling on my um, writing pad, and what I was drawing was um, uh, 3D cubes. Not just random 3D cubes all over this. So when I got to this pivot point here, um, I said to myself, I need to develop a game that's going to be simple and cost effective and we can get it out there quickly. And I remembered those um, little doodle cube platforms that I had been sort of sketching out. And I went and found that business plan and I pulled it apart and I saw those pictures and I said, all right, it's going to be my, uh, my first game. And, um, and it was. I managed to get a team together of two programmers and put a um, build prototype and I took that overseas and I was looking for funding. I said, hey, I've got the game. The PSP had just not long come out. I said, it's going to be a mobile game, it's going to be cool. Um, and I stood in my little booth with my demo and um, after about a year of doing that, um, the publisher said, hey, I like your game. I think we'll give you some money for this. And they did. And some money for it. Um, and so in 2007, um, we published Cube Worldwide for PSP. And it took about just over a year in development. Uh, I had one successful game out there. 
not just the New Zealand, it went straight overseas. In fact, New Zealand wasn't going to get a copy of it at all until I convinced the publisher to send over a few to uh, put on our shelves here. So this is shell, this is when you just go to the shop and buy games. <laughs> um, and what this opportunity meant was that I had a game under my belt. So I knew I had to prove myself um, as a developer if I wanted to get out there and say, here's my idea and this is what I want to do. So Cube was put out there. It was, um, I'll make it sound so easy, but it was the whole point from the concept, developing the prototype until publishing was a massive journey and it was um, a steep learning curve. I never worked with Sony before, and back then they were very extremely strict with the QA. So we spent a good deal of time in the QA, and I was just making sure it's platform ready for the PSP. So I'd sold my um, I guess developer experience, and I thought, right, and just keep in mind that during all this time it's still working on Guardian, still trying to get it underway. So with this um, added um, boost, I put some more energy back into Guardian. At least my can here look a bit sad because that's how I felt. Because <laughs> still nothing was happening. It was just like, what am I doing wrong? What's, why isn't this working? Why isn't anyone looking at this and um, am I not pitching it right? Am I, you know, it, am I telling people it's too expensive and it's putting them off straight away? You know, what, what's the problem? And um, so it all kind of grinded to a halt around about 2008. Um, and I mean that in terms of I wasn't getting the team to actively work on it anymore. And I just spent uh, my own time um, developing the storyline and I has this ability and tongue is like this so, and all that. So just making a lot of notes and things for storyline. And on top of that, which is a good thing, um, there was this changing market that was happening. You know, and um, as I said before, you went to the shop to buy your game. Well now, you know, you can start downloading them to your smartphone device or your phones or wherever the PSP had not long uh, been out after we were released. At the release queue. So we don't need to develop all this, these machines anymore, though we still could. Um, we had a focus on looking at these instead. Um, the major thing with developing for Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft is a high cost involved. And not just that, it's the amount of work you've got to do when you work with Sony. You know, they are really in your face with the game development, they want to know, uh, especially around QA, how it's going. And because it's their um, reputation on the line as well, they just put in the game um, on their machines. So I took the opportunity, quietly, to think about how the market's changed, how it was this and now it's this, and what I could do. I still hadn't found the answer at this point, but it was just all right, watching the market, you know, trying to understand what's coming up next. So around 2013, um, I decided to give it another go and um, got the team back on board to start sketching up some more stuff and, you know, let's get these characters designed and, you know, let's put a bit more effort into the, um, into the story. Um, that's when I had the realisation that this is actually a story. And it didn't matter what platform I put it on, if I could get that story across, then you know, that's cool. But at this point I still didn't have an idea what it would be. Um, so I spent a lot of time concentrating on character design really, and story design, just so I could get it to a point where um, you know, we'd have something more tangible and a lot of character design to work with. Um, as you can see just from these few pictures here, 
we don't see those kind of characters in the earth. Forest fairies, we've got millions and, and all sorts of things going on here. But most of all, there was some creative license. Uh, this is the Hokioi, which is a mythical, well, may not have been mythical, could have been real, for all we know. Um, giant eagle, so it's still not from the house eagle, which is the other giant eagle. This is that, um, another um, eagle that was massive, so you kind of look at the scale there. So we just took time to design out and flesh out these characters. So by this stage, I wasn't looking to make the big two-person action, action adventure anymore. I sort of let that go. And although it would have been nice to, it's sort of like, well, there's other opportunities here um, that I could go for. And so I, basically what I needed, I suppose, was to find the right fit, you know, for the right platform, for the right cost. And then an opportunity came up. <laughs> earlier this year. Um, so we got a successful one out of the passion for the um, interactive fund. And um, I thought it would be a perfect fit. And you'll see why so and so did Film Commission, of course I think. And um, so thank you, Film Commission, because we have really put a big amount of energy and push into getting this to the next stage. So you'll be able to play this in we're going to make it to a say to um, testing on multiple platforms, etc. Um, so we're going to go to Edwin very shortly. Um, I met Edwin about 10 years ago, and uh, we were both speaking at a different event. And um, a couple of years ago, we started discussing um, the Guardian story and how we could work it and um, what it was going to look like. Um, so even and I've been working on the story and the strategy, even more on the strategy, <laughs> the combat, the um, character development and everything else, that we sort of put everything together and um, bring it out in the form of a game book. I suppose it's um, not a book, it's not a game, it's somewhere right in between. And I thought that would be the perfect platform to tell the story because it is very story driven and um, character driven as well. And there are multiple characters within the story that actually have their own story as well. So um, I'll pass it over to Ethan now so he can talk a bit more about the inner workings of um, what I'm doing. I think someone's going to comment how it works, which I really love on the screens for us for a minute. But um, so just while, oh, thank you, um, so just while that's happening, um, the game book idea kind of came about, um, I said, you know, Martin and I have been talking about Guardian for about two years and then writing up the storyline and, yes. and developing the, um, the story much further. At the same time, um, I was noticing, oops, I'll just put back to these. Um, I was noticing, noticing an interesting trend in an area that I've um, always loved, and that was game books. Um, so, by game books, the first, mo the most famous ones um, came out in the 80s, and they were the Final Fantasy game books um, done by Steve, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingston. Uh, and then there were others, like with. Um, whole series uh, that came out all around that time. I fell in love with, with those uh, when I was 10 and I'm reading them. And a lot of people fell in love with them at the time. What I've noticed now is that um, all those who fell in love with those books at the time <coughs> are now my age, of our age, and are, um, there's been a real resurgence and in interest in them. At the same time, going from the old physical pick and path book style into um, digital versions. And over the last, I think, from the from the time that we were first talking about Guardian, there, was, there wasn't a lot around. I think only Tin Man games and maybe another couple of outfits were making these. And since then, uh, there are so many of them. Like the, the market is exploding and the, there's um, a much bigger market now for them that like they're being consumed. So it's now become a really viable way to tell interesting stories. 
um, and, and this kind of quite old medium that's having a, a really interesting resurgence. So, um, the first step, of course, because it's essentially it's interactive, but it's still essentially linear, as in you are still um, going from A to, well, as I say, A to Z with, with Maya. She's the main protagonist. So, where, where it differs from the old game books is that it was always you are the hero and you kind of slot yourself onto that role. Um, the annoying thing with the on fine side with Steve Jackson and Liv Anderson was they always assume that you're a guy for a start, but that, that was the time, unfortunately. So um, we're doing something a little different where it's, kind of, it's a third person perspective where you are actually making the decisions for mine. So you're kind of riding around the story inside of you. So the first thing was just a classic bit of story like we had to work out how does this journey actually play out? Um, we just my start. Um, yeah, okay, if we talk about the locations a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we. It's gonna, if you want, if you don't want to know, leave the room. You're gonna yeah, yeah, for yourself. Spoil the story. <laughs> You're gonna spoil the story. <laughs> the, the, the base, I, I won't go into, uh, there is a whole side of the game that I won't go into. Um, but as far as like uh, this first episode starts uh, in the uh, field then and takes fire to a place called Tetapu Fenel, or the Forbidden Lands. And the basic area that we finally decided on, after initially we were talking about setting it around the Rotorua area, and then we got talking and, and thought, well, we're both Maitai, and we're both Nanti um, why don't we set it down south? And so then we shifted it to beginning in uh, Fuel Land, uh, and kind of taking a route that sort of gets you over into the, the Wakatipu area. Um, which, interesting, just when you were talking then, I just had a flashback, a, a memory of, um, I was walking part of the route and track going from the field land side, and an idea came to me, why don't we have like a really awesome, epic Māori adventure story set down there? <laughs> and I never went to did it, so when, when Marty's uh, Guardian idea came up, that, that just kind of synced in my head and went, yes, this, this is exactly the story I wanted to tell. Um, so yeah, it's, um, Guardian is it's interactive, it's choice and consequence, so the, the basic uh, format is getting Maya from A to Z, uh, from you know, her home part to the um, to, to double fairway. Um, and of course, there's a, there's a reason why she has to do that. She's is both pushed and pulled factors for why she has to leave her home. Um, kind of classic heroes doing stuff, really. Um, however, along the way, that's where the pathways come in. So um, while you will end up at the, at the same place near the end, it's how you get there and in what sort of shape do you get there that makes a real difference. And in that way, it's a similar kind of structure to, the, say, the Telltale games. Uh, if if you have played say the Walking Dead or, or the Game of Thrones one, it kind of does that. Like, it'll have a set ending that you're getting to, but the really interesting part is the interesting journey that you take to get there. Um, so for this, um, first we have to try and get our head around an interactive story, and the easiest way is to visualize it. So um, I started just using uh, this um, Google app, Draw.io. Is anybody familiar with Google I don't use it a little bit? It's basically just a diagramming app, but it, see, but it allows me to do up things like that, where I can, these are like, say, the major set pieces of the narrative and how they connect to each other and, and the basic choices that maybe lead from one scenario to another. And, but they're, they're the macro versions, so that's kind of like, all this stuff is gonna happen in this one mode. And then what I do for each, for the more complex modes, I'll then drill down. So let's say um, it's an interactive conversation between Maya and another character, then I'll drill down and I'll do another map that specifically deals with that mode and how that plays out. And then by the end of that, I know, you see you've got multiple endings here. They basically become variable. So I know that, okay, if Maya has taken this approach with um, this character, then that variable's been ticked, which means there's going to be a consequence to that later on. It may not happen straight away, it may be just a difference of the item she's carrying, it may be a difference in 
the reaction of people later on, but I can track all of that sort of stuff so that the, the narrative starts to feel alive as in like little decisions that you make here really do pay off later on. And the inspiration for using this particular system I'll, I'll be talking about, which is Inkscript, um, came from uh, the guys at Inkle who made the 80 Days app, uh, which as soon as I saw it, I just fell in love with it. It was an amazing piece of interactive fiction. And it was the best thing I'd seen come out of the, uh, of the game box at the time, and I think still holds up to be one of the best. Uh, the ankle guys here really know what they're doing. So they, initially we, we trialled this um, uh, product of these ankle writer, they offer it for free, and it allows you to make interactive fiction pieces. However, um, it soon, we soon found that to be, yeah, it was really easy for me to jump in and, and um, start working with, which is important, because I mean, I'm a, a writer first and a designer second, so, um, when things get technical, then I start banging my head against the keyboard. Um, so it had to be you know, easy to get into. However, I soon found that the actual functionality, like the, how you track choice and consequence in there was very clunky, and Inkle wasn't choosing to support it, um, technically. So it, kind of, it became a bit of a dead end, but it did allow us to make um, relatively I won't say easily, but relatively quickly, to make some nice playable demos that we could then send into the, the Twin Commission um, application so that you could actually at least feel what the Guardian story was going to be like. So from there, it was a matter of going, well, okay, where to next? And I, I looked at a few different interactive options. I, I had played around with Inform 7 before I had looked at um, Twy, but it's still, I just loved the way that Inkle does stuff, so then I saw that they offer this Ink script, which is um, uh, open source, um, and I thought, oh gosh, I'm a writer, and I'm about to learn a scripting language, okay, let's give it a go. And it actually proved to be a lot easier than I thought. Um, so this is uh, a sample from their 80 days. As you can see, it's all pretty much done with Marker, so um, the stuff just generates a choice, uh, and there are lots of other little simple things that you can do. Like that means that that one is going to connect up to there if you make that choice. And once you kind of get to know all the little functions, you start to be able to make quite a seamless feeling um, text based narrative. And yes, it was a steep learning curve for me, but not as steep as I feared it would be. Um, and soon I just started to actually really enjoy the process. So the reason that script, yeah, really paid off was it easily allows me to wrangle lots of different pathways. So um, I can jump from different pathways and, and track the consequences. I can put in variables, so um, I can manage items, I can manage health stats, um, I can do things like um, track choices, so if you made that choice there, then that option later, it might say that choice might unlock another choice that you can make later on. If you didn't make that choice, then it's not going to show up. And that kind of switching uh, options off and on all the time, so that you really tailor, tailor the player's experience so that whatever they do in the past very much affects what, they, what they're able to do later on. It's uh, one point where I has a skill test, she has to throw something, and I can do simple things I work out the stats of it. Is there a 75% chance of that um, working? And do that very simply in that script. And the last thing, which I think, which I'm personally most excited about, is this um, story driven combat system, which might immediately go. <laughs> now, the idea for this uh, came from. Um, a game book by Dave Morris and uh, Jane Thompson, which was the um, Dragon sorry, Way of the No Way of the Tiger series. It was a ninja series, and then it, it, it had this nice mechanic. I've never seen it anywhere else, where you had a set selection of moves that you could make as your ninja, and it described your enemy in a certain way, so that if you were astute about it, you could pick up. Oh, okay. 
So they're quite top heavy. They say it's a lumber and troll of some point kind of top heavy, but their legs are a little bit on the weak side. So probably my dragon tail throw is going to work a lot better than my tooth the tiger throw, and the book actually pays that off. So you've got to actually be quite observant as you're going into a battle and make the right choices. And so I thought, well, let's give this a go. Um, because it's based on this, and this is something I only just coined the other day with Rachel, is the yoga principle, which is this. In decision making, you observe, you decide, you act. And what I'd seen in game books was there wasn't enough of the observation going on. Like you would go down a tunnel and I ask you to go left or right, or are you going to open the door or not? It didn't give you information. And I think the most important advance in this particular format is to actually make sure that the player is making informed decisions the whole time. They have the information they need. If they read it closely enough, they will be able to make the right choices. It's really um, how they unpack the teams. So, I think we do have time for a very quick demo. Sure. Cool. So, I will jump in here. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is, um, and it's quite good as it can also. Um, export to HTML for us, so we can do test runs outside of the engine. So I'm, uh, we, I won't read through it very much, but this is, so this is Maya starting out at the beginning of the game. She hears something coming. Um, what do you want to do? Do you want to dive for cover or freeze and listen? Hands up for dive for cover. Dive for cover. Who wants to freeze and listen? Okay, just freeze and listen. Great. We freeze and listen, and look, there's a troll with pre club raised ready to crack my skull like a nut. Great. And it looks like it's the scout, so she's worried that the par is now in trouble, so she draws her party. So now we're into our um, story driven um, system here. So we'll quickly go through. The troll's right eye is milky, it's eye socket traversed by a scar that runs from her forehead deep into her right cheek. As the troll hips his heavy club in his right hand, Maya notes that the warrior's right arm is more muscular than the left, a right-hander, meaning that when she strikes, she will leave her right flank vulnerable, even more so thanks to the blind rubbed arm. Then again, judging by her many other battle scars, this troll is a veteran of war and may well be aware of her vulnerability, dangerously so. Okay, so what should we do? Should we uh, Overhead strike, go for the belly, go for the right flank, or uh, the troll's throat. Oh, I'll just put Mr. Ninja Kiwi man there. Oh, what do you think? Um, say... Right flank. Right flank? Cool. And she raises her club, intending to crush my skull. Um, yes, her field of vision appeared on her right side. The troll was too slow to react. We got her. Got her hit once. So, that's taken one health down and, and we're still okay. So she's not down yet. So what do we, what do we think? Overhead strike, stab, or slice the throat? Do you like to make a take a shot at it? Go for the throat. <laughs> we do. And oh, yeah, it's cut her, but it's also, hang on, what's happened there? Can you do belly? Oh, I put the belly one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if we'd gone for the throat, then it would have been, we would have hit each other, which means Maya would have lost one as well. Sorry, I panicked. <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, it's, it's sort of, um, yeah, it makes the combat a whole reading experience and, and through observation. So, so um, if you're not paying attention, you get pulled out of it when you're reading. <laughs> but if you are, you know, really unpacking the text, it just um, means that you're really in that experience, you know, blow by blow, um, and hopefully getting some, you know, some, some uh, interesting story points out of it too. So, um, and that sort of thing is, again, relatively easy to do, just tracking variables so that I know which moves been taken, um, the health stats, what effect it's going to take, and all of that. And uh, again, for a writer, this has been quite liberating because I didn't think I'd be able to manage all of these different stats and um, conditions and so on, but it's actually been really good. So, yes, I'm very good with that.
Um, so, yeah, we've gone. But I don't know how much time we've got left. We've got about 10, 10 minutes. minutes or so. Yeah, so, shall we yeah. field some questions? Yeah, if you want to yeah. ask any questions or anything. I think one thing about this that I've learned um, with this format is that it can be so easily applied to anything, you know, it, especially so since we're also doing games like uh, for health and education. So, you imagine um, sort of where e-health and e-therapy and all that is going. Potentially, you could write out this, a scenario where you make choices based on what you're going, you know, what you may have to do. So say it's a training for it uh, to be achieved easily. Do you, what would your next thing be in the kitchen? It could be applied to a whole bunch of other stuff. But anyway, that's just something mm. I thought I'd, I'd mention because it, you know, it makes for good action adventure. It also makes for a really good um, learning, you know, interactive learning. It may not be the game game, like you might see like Star Wars or something, um, which is a, a different game that we made, but because it immerses you and you have to actually read it to make the right decisions, it would have um, worked really well. In that sense. But anyway, if you have any questions um, for either of us, then fire away. techniques that we can use. So one is um, that through the text I've ha I have made sure that I've referred to both the, the Māori and English names for things and then try to tailor the context so that even if I have just used the Māori word you'll be able to work out what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but our other possibility is that, um, because I, actually I hasten that, this is of course not the final uh, how it's going to look. Um, mm. It's going to be packaged in with imagery with a new eye and so on. So this is very much the back end. It will still be text heavy, but it will be um, done in a UI. So we might be able to have tap on glossary. So if, you know, say for Patu or um, Pa or English May, there's a little bit of tap on the I think that would be relatively easy to do. Yeah. I hope. Because one of the difficult things is that um, if we were to take a word like Karakia, which means incantation or prayer you know, in English, it kind of almost takes away from what it is if we don't say karakia. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like she says a prayer and it's like, it's not quite. Not that, quite. <laughs> and it's yeah. not a spell either. No, it's, 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 it's. You could have a sort of in game translate or impress it. Exactly, yeah. that's yeah. what we're thinking about. Yeah. But it, but it is tricky, we have to get those definitions really right. Yeah. Um, and it's the same like um, with the Tanifa, you know, but I think most of New Zealand probably knows what a Tanifa is, being a monster or a guardian or whatever, because there's many different types of Tanifa. So we don't want to call on the monster, because it just makes it sound so generic, you know, it's the Tanifa, it's like, wow, what's a Tanifa? You know, and by having something there that people can access, you know, just in case they don't quite understand what it is. But we think after you go through the first maybe you know, paragraph or two, mm -hmm. then it would just be a normal word, you know, be, be kind of normalised into, oh right, that's a tanifa, and that's a karakia. So every time you see the word karakia come up again through the story, you sort of like, okay, you mm -hmm. know what she's doing. And, and yeah. we can actually take a... Um, you know, because it's ostensibly a fantasy piece, we can kind of take a similar approach to fantasy stories where uh, they'll inter they'll be introducing new names and new concepts and things like that and can put them in context so you can kind of explain them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so we've got a couple of, yeah, a few approaches there. Is the title is it a global or a national audience that you want to go for? Definitely global, isn't it? Definitely global, mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll be releasing this um, to the App Store and Google Play 
uh, sometime around the end of no, uh, October, maybe mid-November, and um, it would be free to play. You know, um, because it was funded, um, I think that's one of the requirements is that it's freely available. Um, and so we can restrict that to New Zealand, but we want to see, well, we want to follow the interest, how many downloads, um, all the data that we'll be able to see in the App Store and Google Play, how many people are engaging and all that, because that'll just give us um, the data we need to see if we go on to episode two, because, I forgot to mention, the actual Guardian story oh, is yes. quite big. Yes. It's, it's massive, actually. But this um, release is only a third of it. So we take Maya from her pa to the top of Benua, and where there's a reveal, and so it ends on a kind of clip yeah. where you want to know more. And if people, and if the interest is there, we'll gauge social media and all of that. Um, and if there is a, you know, wow, we're waiting for the next one, where is it? Then we're either going to try out options again. It could be a publishing deal, a distribution deal, or um, New Zealand Film might give us some more money, or we might go on to, um, uh, you call it like Kickstarter, thing, yeah. um, crowdfunding. And then the audience can tell us how much they want it because they'll either fund it or they won't. And so before we make that decision, they will watch what's happening after it's been released, just to see if, um, you know, if there's a lot of people engaged and there's a lot of feedback here, then we'll be more confident in which direction um, we're going to still start episode two. And um, there's a little bit of an indication in the um, uh, in the game book communities now, and, and the sort of interest that certain game books are getting now is that it, it shows which markets are, are quite hungry for this type of format, and it's very much it's the UK, um, the Australian market's quite quite strong on the children, and um, for some reason Spain loves game books and they love making them too. So we, may, we might want to localise to Spanish. Yes. I know, well, see, that's the other issue we have too, is when we localise, you know, do we still keep that on? Of course we do. Of course we do. <laughs> no. yeah. but, um, yeah. I kind of thought about saying something, it's not really a question, but um, I was sort of looking at the, the like page page size of this stuff. There's a talk by John Ingold, who's like the guy who owns Ingold, the mm. guy who wrote the thing. Yeah, but um, he sort of talks about how uh, just sort of like a matter of attention span, like people can only sort of read about this much before they kind of start skimming. Yes. yes. And I sort of already, like, like how I said, I wasn't paying attention, and it was kind of like I was already kind of skimming over the second half of the, the page. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what he sort of says about that is that ink is really, really great for being able to break text into smaller pieces. So I've used text before, and like I. You can kind of fake choice, like you can have choices, but they just go to the same place as more. Yeah, and you know, you can kind of break break it into little pieces quite easily without any little effort comes in the scripting language. And actually, um, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. And um, mm -hmm. as you can see, like that's I actually tried to make pretty much that the maximum amount of text that you have at any one time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's not always manageable just based on what the the stories do. But it, yeah, I do you know what you mean, and I think one of my critiques of a few of the game books out there now is that it gives you far too much reading. Because nobody can to... read this much text. Mm -hmm. No, no, they're not. But in, in something like that, you can almost sort of like focus in on a little detail, and it almost just as a sort of next button, almost like yeah. it have to be a choice, but it's kind of just like a they'll, they'll absorb this much, and then they'll absorb that much, but this much they'll start skipping. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, we can learn a few things from the visual novel market. Because that, that actually very good at doing that kind of thing, just pass something out of the text. Yeah. That'll be a nice. Um, or once, because we've literally just got the Unity Thank You thing going now, and um, part of that design process is where the images are on the screen, where the buttons are. So we're sort of setting up the whole UI, I guess, now, so we can bring this Thank You file, and and um, you know that point about putting a small amount of text on the screen. Or um, the screen size could probably, you know, well, it will probably have to be a small amount of text anyway, mm. especially on the phone. 
And so the, the other thing was, I think Michael brought it up for this, was do we continually scroll or is it the next? So we're kind of going through these questions now about you know presentation of the yeah. of the text, the images, and where the button's going to sit, and whether we're going to have a fancy sort of you know, circle. Thing. But anyway, <laughs> to all these little bits and pieces for um, the look and the visuals of the of the book. So yeah, but it's a good point. Yeah, that's, yeah, we, that's, uh, yeah, about optimizing the reading experience. And I think yeah, the uncle guys again are leading the way because I think the way they've done the sorcery series for instance mm -hmm. and how they pass out the text and that's really good. And I I find them extremely readable. So I think it's got something to do with just reading from the screen. Yes, in general, like people are used to sort of skimming around and scrolling and scrolling. Mm -hmm. so, like, I think that's absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, so we need to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. One more question. Well, awesome. We'll be working for you guys. Oh, right. Good point. Now, well, Again, have a look at meteor.co.nz. We don't have any link, oh no, not at the moment. Um, but in terms of when we release, you know, it's, I think we have a Facebook page, it's not very busy. <laughs> I don't really post that often on it, um, just every now and then. But once um, uh, Guardian is coming in, because on top of this, we're working on a social media plan as well. Like, when are we going to start? like about four weeks before Guardian is released, when are we going to start releasing images and some, build some awareness around it? And uh, yeah, so by then our Facebook page will be very active um, for promotion of this because we want as many people to download and, and go through this as possible and we want as much feedback as possible as well. We want to know what the community thinks and that they're enjoying the story, you know, whatever it is. I prefer good feedback, but you know, negative feedback is fine too because it will just tell us where you know we may improve somewhere along the line. Um, yeah, otherwise, there's not really any information on this online at the moment, and it's just a website link for my business as usual. Yeah, it does remind me of an idea because it might be the one struggle with. I think was that the actual learning documentation was pretty hard to go through. It wasn't very really user friendly, and I managed to find one <coughs> video series where one person had gone through and actually explained quite a few of the things. So maybe uh, an ink tutorial series uh, brought to you by Guardian could be, yeah. could be a nice little writing strategy, but we'll see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.